end. At the very end, I'll answer questions. Yes. Well, uh, folks, uh, welcome to our uh, monthly uh, presentation. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Irene Hinky Sacolato. I'm going to do a brief bio, and I also want to remind everybody to please mute uh, during the uh, presentation. If you would like to ask a question, I'm going to ask that you put it in the chat, or um, Irene will take questions at the end. At the end. You can turn your audio back on, and I'll talk to you. Great. So. Okay, so uh, just a brief bio, just a little bit about her. Since 1979, Irene has led numerous tours under the Osprey Photo Workshops and Tours, and she's conducted many photographic workshops at two zoos, nature centers, and organizations like the Nature Na National Wildlife Federation and the Assateague Island Alliance. She regularly lectures at Johns Hopkins University and conducts seminars all across the country. Um, her classes include nature, wildlife, garden photography, travel photography, plus uh, programs on locations such as the Brazilian Panatal, Iceland, and Chincoteague. Um, her photography has appeared in numerous magazines, books, calendars, note cards, and posters for national campaigns. She has degrees in biology and chemistry and a background in environmental sciences. She's contributed more than 70 images to the Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge's new Herbert H. Bateman Administrative and Educational Center and other interpretive displays. And over the past 30 years, she's led 200 programs in more than 80 locations in the United States and abroad. Loudoun Photography Club is pleased to welcome Irene on this presentation which is entitled uh, A Passion for Wildlife Photography. Irene, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Okay, and I am going to go to share screen and hopefully I'm going to pop up. One more hit and I should be up there. There's my little friend squirrel there. I'll tell you, you a little bit about it. him. You got it. Okay, we're we're good to go. Uh, as she mentions, I do, you know, I'm 15 years old. Yeah, right. Uh, I've been doing wildlife photography for a long time since the late 70s, early 80s. And, um, but I've been <clears throat> recently over the last, I guess, 20 some years, I've been doing photo workshops. Tangier Island is one of them, Chincoteague, Assateague, Outer Banks, South Dakota, Badlands, Bosque, Bosque Little Apache, and uh, in New Mexico, et cetera. So um, my website is listed here, ospreyphoto.com. Uh, if you log on to that, you can see some of my workshops. You can also see my newsletter. And with that, that's all the advertising I'm gonna do. Um, basically, I'm gonna talk about some of the requirements and that go beyond equipment for wildlife photography, lighting, composition, exposure, things that apply to all sorts of photography, locating and approaching animals, capturing action and safety and ethics in the field. Why do I like uh, photographing animals? I just find uh, the connection with them, the beauty, the adaptations, uh, they're just absolutely, animals are absolutely remarkable and uh, being able to adapt to various uh, ecological niches, et cetera. So I like, I like observing. I like connecting with them and I like sharing some of the information that I come back with with other people. And I enjoy some of the humor that I see in the field and certainly prairie dogs are one of my favorites. They have a real fixation on tails. I haven't figured that one out, but I've seen more than one grab the tail of the other one. So I don't quite know what that's about. Um, and I was in McNeil River up in Alaska and I so thoroughly enjoyed watching this young bear try to figure out he caught the salmon, but he doesn't quite know how to keep a hold of it. Uh, so he's rolling around and it's fun to photograph that. The other thing I really like photographing is the fact that I can see things in the images that I couldn't or didn't see with my eyes. For instance, the upper uh, left image is a dowager. I thought their bills were stiff. I thought, you know, they couldn't bend. You look in the books, uh, your bird books and so forth, and it just shows a straight bill, but they can actually manipulate the end of the bill. Uh, it has tactile sensors there when he probes down into the mud or sand wherever he's feeding, he can feel around for organisms and swallow them. And I always knew that puffins could kind of, 
use their wings underwater. They did that a lot better, really, than they do flying and landing on on rocks, etc. But I never figured out that one would prop himself up with his wing while he scratched. Uh, also, I didn't figure that they ate flowers, but they seemed to. And my neighbor told me about a fox that would visit her um, her bird bath. And one day I was over there and, and caught that image. And I just thought that was really cool that he took advantage and he came all the way up on it, all four paws. I'm actually super amazed and enjoying documenting things that I can't believe. I mean, the fact that that cormorant will swallow that fish. I've seen uh, gray blue herons swallow things a lot bigger than that. Uh, they can expand their esophagus and be able to get that whole fish down. I saw the tail just sticking out of his mouth. Uh, he swallowed the whole works. I really enjoyed seeing different feeding habits of birds. For instance, uh, this is a tricolored heron. I've seen more reddish egrets do this uh, down in Florida, but it's called canopy feeding. But the bottom line is he's using that wing to shade the water and also it, it covers up the reflection of his neck and his bill so he has an easier chance of attracting fish. And this one over here was taken on Tanger Island where I do, I do two workshops there each year uh, in the spring, but I've never seen or heard anybody talking about about this particular behavior, but it's a little blue heron. The tip of his bill is, is black. And what he'd do was he'd go along and just gently touch the water with that bill. And what I am, and he'd go keep going along and doing that until he maybe caught a fish. Uh, but that was his fishing technique. He, his touching the water with his bill really acted like, uh, maybe there's a bug there and the fish kind of got fooled by it. But I assume that was his purpose, but I've never seen anybody talk about it. There's a lot more that's needed than just, just having the right equipment. You can have basic equipment, get great images. Uh, some of the newer equipment's got some advantages, but it takes a lot more than, than just that. I mean, it takes having the power of observation, being able to stay there, watch, connect with the subjects, having a patience, having knowledge of both your camera and the wildlife, and having a degree of curiosity and imagination for, gee, what's going on. These guys, uh, I went for a walk, it was early COVID. And one of the few places I could walk was a local park about five minutes from my house. And I was always looking for woodpeckers up in cavities. And one day walking along, I didn't see a woodpecker, but I saw something gray. And I saw it sticking its little head out of the cavity. And so the next day I came back for about four days actually photographing these little fellas doing different things. There were about, I think there's a fourth one. Uh, you only see the three in the one shot there, um, but they would go in and out of the hole and eventually they left. And the chances of ever doing this again is gone because that tree's lightning hit it and that section is broken off. So that will never be again. The more you know about your subjects, the better off you are. The more time you're in the field, the better off you are. Uh, but the more you know, the more you can anticipate what's going to happen. And you can find out things now so much from the web, but from your ca camera club friends, from locals. You know, you talk to somebody, you've been seeing some, uh, maybe some turkeys in the field. Hey, you know, do they, what time of day they come? Do they always come out? Gee, have a nice conversation with your neighbor. Uh, you can learn a lot, but this turkey is doing full displays. His tail is fanned, the wings are dragging, his chest is out. I want to refer to this pose a little bit later um, and what it's all about. Curiosity, I said, was one of the things. I got real curious. This was at Assateague Island. Um, and I saw the rabbit down on the ground and it was eating grass and that's no big deal. Okay, I'll take some pictures. And all of a sudden I see him hop up on this fence rail. And I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. He's just sitting there on the fence rail and he's nibbling on things. And then he stood up and I could not believe that it had the balance, et cetera, to stand up. And I have no idea of why that little piece of grass that looks dead to me was attractive to him. And the fact that he risked uh, his balance, et cetera, to get a hold of it. Um, so curiosity, I'm always wondering why and, and what's up. This guy I saw at a distance, this was in Chincoteague. And one of the things I do is try to prepare ahead of time. If I spot a potential subject, number one, I'm always looking for uh, birds perched. I'll talk about that a little bit later, particularly kingfishers. Uh, this 
is a female. Um, it's opposite. Uh, the male is the more plain uh, bird. But I saw it at a distance sitting on a post and I thought, well, there's a chance maybe he'll sit there long enough. And I got, I had a 600 millimeter lens uh, with a 1.4 teleconverter on it. And I was in the car and I had a big bean bag on the windshield, wind sill, you know, window sill of the car. Uh, and I kind of slowly moved into position. I had already uh, figured out what exposure I was going to use. I needed a fast shutter speed, et cetera. So the lens was going to be fairly wide open. And I cruised up and I got the photograph this bird for maybe 30, 45 minutes. Uh, it came back and forth to that post. I got some other shots of it landing with the feet out. I got preening shots. I got shots with the fish, et cetera. I never got him plunging into the water because I couldn't see down that low. Uh, there were bushes in the way, but I had a marvelous morning with him. Every day is different. Every sunrise, sunset is different. So the thing that's really important is to take advantage of photo opportunities as they come to you and don't depend on them being there tomorrow. And it certainly was the case with these images here. The Sandhill Cranes, this is from Bosque de la Pache in New Mexico, but for me to capture a nice warm color, the moon in the background, et cetera, I probably will never get that again. The standoff between the fox and the mouse was in Chincoteague. That was on the main road heading to the beach. Um, as you would guess, the mouse didn't win in the end. Uh, and then there was the weird thing that I saw that I've never seen before. This, the two bottom images are of a clapper rail. It's in Tangier Island in one of the uh, waterways. And the tide was out some. And there was this crab. And apparently, these guys usually eat something small, like little periwinkle, little items. Uh, but it took on this crab. And the crab was rather feisty, as you can see, snapping at the, the rail. But the rail eventually grabbed it and walked off into the into the uh, marsh with it. And I assume got to eat part of it without getting pinched. Um, so that I don't think I will ever, ever see again. It was very unusual. Getting the image right in the camera is the thing that you hear all the time with whatever type of photography you're doing. Uh, you don't wanna have to depend on post-processing to fix problems. <clears throat> if, if your image is way far overexposed, you can't get those details back. Uh, if it's moving too much for the shutter speed that you have, uh, you're not going to freeze the action. If it's a real busy background, uh, you may or may not be able to fix it. Um, some photographers, the thing that they love about photography, like Tony Sweet, which I really admire, he'll shoot with the post-processing in mind. Uh, that's his thing. He loves manipulating the images. That's his artistic uh, flair. He's, he's great. Um, my thing is being with the birds and actually doing the photography. And if I have to do a whole lot of post-processing, that doesn't thrill me, then I didn't do my job. And I do shoot raw, fi oopsie, raw files. And um, one thing to say about shooting raw files is that you gather the most information you can get in terms of tone and in terms of color. Every once in a while, we can talk about mistakes. Check your settings because every once in a while, I screw up. And I took the setting off a of raw and I sat it on JPEG and it was a small JPEG file. And I could not blow that image up very much or do a whole lot of manipulation with it. Being familiar with your equipment is really important. You don't wanna have to, uh, when you get into position, you don't wanna have to look down and find your different controls. You wanna know basically without looking at the camera where your, your uh, ISO button is, any kind of exposure compensation button, which way you turn your zoom lens to make the magnification higher. All those things you'd rather be able to do without taking and having to take your eye away from the viewfinder and maybe missing some action. You gotta be ready to react quickly. Um, with the Kingfisher, I had time, I was lucky. Uh, but I had evaluated the situation ahead of time. I looked at which direction the light was coming from, et cetera. And that's definitely the case with this little fella here. Um, anytime I see a subject, I'm going to go, okay, is he going to be, he's going to let me get close or am I going to have to use a real long lens? What kind of background do I want? What kind of light uh, am I hoping he's going to be? And can I get everything all set before I even approach the subject? You can tell that he's certainly alert. His ears are up. 
his eyes are staring at something which probably is a squirrel. Uh, that was his favorite. And the paws up and you know something, uh, he's, he's poised to action. Uh, unfortunately for the squirrel down the bottom there, uh, it did not fare too well. I refine my images over and over. As I'm looking through the camera and as I'm processing images, I am constantly deciding what I could have done better. Uh, when I'm in the field, maybe I can change the background. Maybe I can have it more environmental. Maybe I just want to get some of the details on the head, the breeding uh, colors of this particular bird. I wanna be careful. Sometimes I do dumb things like cut off the ends of tails when I'm so enthralled with like the crest of a blue jay. I've done that before. So I wanna carefully look at my images and make sure I'm not doing something like that in terms of uh, a problem. I wanna make sure my background is not competing with my subject. And I drew that orange line there because sometimes I'm, <clears throat> I mentioned about cutting off tails. Well, sometimes you end up cutting off feet. Uh, I always try to leave room at the bottom of the frame for even if I can't see where these legs are going, I can estimate about where they're gonna hit bottom and leave a little bit of a platform for them to stand on. So I usually try to not cut things like this, uh, but to give space uh, for the thing to stand on. It's just like, you don't wanna cut off people's feet uh, when you take a portrait picture. Light has everything to do with photography. It's got color, it's got strength and quality, and it's got direction. And uh, one of the things that seems maybe a little odd or not necessary is when I'm starting to approach a subject, I take a, take a quick glance up at the sky and I evaluate what I'm dealing with. Um, is the sun hitting in the right direction? Am I getting some side light or front light? Or do I wanna move a little different in terms of position? Is there a, soft cloud that's going to go across the sun and soften light, and maybe I can get better images. Um, are the storm clouds coming? Oops, there's storm clouds coming. Maybe that's going to be good, and it's going to give a lot of drama to the picture, or maybe it's going to be bad, and it's going to cut off all my light, uh, and it's going to rain. Uh, so uh, taking and evaluating what you're going to be working with, and as the sun shifts also, you may have, I, I had this problem at my friend's house, uh, the light would shift and all of a sudden the shadow from the house would fall across the backyard and that was the end of that. Um, so even looking for things like that. Uh, in terms of color, of course at sunrise, sunset you get color and make sure you look all around. Make sure I like to have color in the water if possible, color with the uh, looking up in the sky that you have some color in the clouds. Early in the morning, late in the afternoon, you have this beautiful light often uh, that's very warm. Uh, it's really bringing out the copper colors in this particular male. Uh, it's a Rio Grande turkey. I was careful when I took the picture that he didn't lean too far forward because there would be shadow over the face. But the reason I pointed out that earlier Tom Turkey was when I first saw this guy, I saw a turkey that was basically poised like that earlier one was. He was in full strut. And that meant two things to me. I could go drive on and go do something else, take a couple pictures of that and then off. But no, I think I wanted to stay around. What is he what is he displaying for? Is there another Tom Turkey around? Is there going to be a fight? Nope. That wasn't it. Ah, I see five females over there. And one of the females goes along and then she squats a little. And she goes along and she squats a little. And that's a good indication that she's ready to, to breed. She's, re she's ready for him to come over to her. Um, and I've seen that with other birds. I've seen it with avocets. I've seen it also uh, if you watch deer even. Um, but the other thing I love about early in the morning and late in the afternoon, not only do you have uh, these beautiful colors like in the fox, it really brings out the red of the fox, but also, um, it's a good time of day to be shooting because the animals are more active usually in the morning and in the late afternoon. Not always, but often. Uh, quality light is really important. Soft light, like in the early morning, late afternoon, or on a day that maybe a nice light cloud went across the sun or some open shade areas. Uh, we've got a light haze layer going across. Uh, soft light can be very complimentary. This, it makes this little chipmunk really look cute. Uh, and also, 
I don't have problems with shadows, harsh shadows falling across the body of this chipmunk. Uh, nothing's being blocked. He's nice, evenly lit. When it comes to the background with soft lighting, it's a help also because in the case of this wimbrel, not wimbrel, willet, sorry, um, background here was probably a wave. Uh, if it had been like 11 o'clock and bright and sunny, that would have been very distracting behind the bird. Uh, right now, no, it's not. Also, I'm shooting from a low angle. I'll talk about that again. But you can see shooting from eye level really gives you a nice smooth background uh, if it's at a distance away, and often it is. The bottom picture here was done uh, in uh, Brazil. It's a green kingfisher. Uh, the light was very low. It was almost the sun had just about set. And I used a tripod. Uh, I had the camera on a tripod. I used electronic cable release because I didn't want to touch the camera when I took that exposure. I probably used a very slow shutter speed and I took a number of images because I was just praying that one of them might be sharp. And there were there were two or three that actually ended up being sharp and I'm surprised. Um, but the background is beautiful behind it. And that's part, all the detail in the bird and the background, that's all due to that nice, nice soft light in that late afternoon. Animals in the woods, you don't wanna have a bright sunny uh, day for animals in the woods. You'd like to have a little light color, uh, light cover uh, over the sun. You wanna have soft light because otherwise you end up with a mess like you have down here where you've got very hot, uh, bright areas and you've got other areas that are extremely uh, deep in shadow. With white subjects, you're gonna have to excuse me every now and again, uh, I'm gonna take a sip of water, so. Okay, white subjects, um, soft light also is helpful photographing them. Um, if I didn't have the soft light, I wouldn't have been able to see, this is a, really the muscle, it shows uh, a tonal gradient here. It indicates probably this is where the muscle, wing muscle is. Uh, that soft light cast some shadows uh, that gave some de definition to the wings. So not only do you have this, but you also have this extra detail. As the day gets brighter and brighter, white areas elsewhere on the swan are gonna kick light into the shadow areas that are giving you definition. Uh, and then the, bird looks just flat white uh, with no detail. Where the light comes from, whether it's from behind you and you're getting um, straight on front lighting, um, it can give you decent pictures. Uh, this one is very sharp. It's a, it's a uh, black bellied plover in winter plumage. Uh, you can see a lot of feather detail. Uh, the eye is lit, that's good and sharp. I even like the fact that you can see a lot of detail in the legs of the bird. And also, I took this picture with those things in the orange background, uh, not thinking that they were distractions, but they're part of uh, the ecological system here. Um, periodically, this was at Chincoteague, the Bayside, um, this, these blobs are actually organisms. Uh, they're tunicates, they're filter feeding organisms and they're colonial. And so you get these orange blops. Uh, I have only seen them once. Uh, they wash in periodically and that's what you have here. And I had to ask the biologist about them because I did not know what they were and they told me details. But that shot wasn't very three-dimensional. Side lighting gives give you a really nice three-dimensional feel to the picture. It shows texture. Uh, the feathers on the wood stork look like they're jumping off the page. Omo, she can really see how rough uh, the texture in the neck is. Uh, this is just a lovely uh, picture very early in the morning of a great blue heron, a little different than the ones you usually see. The head, we still got a little light back here and the head is against that light. Very nice. Down here in the bottom where we've got the little turtle in the sand, if I hadn't had light that was very low, very much to the side, just skimming the surface, I would not be able to see the footprints of the turtle because I wouldn't have those shadows that indicated uh, that he had made depressions in the sand. And also you get a feeling for a little bit of the uh, undulation of the sand itself. I threw these two in, these are 
these these are from my uh, presentation that I'm going to be doing on on Badlands, but they're two nice side lighting images. Um, this one, I didn't. Re I, well, I just recently pulled this one. I just really love the fact that you can see the grasses. This is a sage grouse, uh, but the lighting works really well with the grasses and the grouse itself. Over here, uh, we have a big horn sheep, and it was very late in the afternoon. And I just love the warm light and the way it basically, it, it was very three-dimensional. It shows all the ridges and so forth in the horns of the uh, ram. Light can come from behind as well as the side and the front. Uh, when it comes from behind, you can get what's called hair light, uh, used portrait photographers. Also, that backlighting was helping show up these water droplets. Okay, we've got some backlighting here. Here, I waited a few minutes. There was a shaft of uh, golden light that was coming down through those trees around sunset. And I waited until he walked into that beam before I took the shot because it did a beautiful job of outlining uh, the fox. This was uh, also in the Badlands, both of these. And I just pulled these recently. It's just a good example, again, of backlighting and rim light uh, in both these cases. Pronghorns are so pretty. When light passes through a subject, instead of outlining it, it passes through the wings, uh, even the bills of these thick build um, turns. Uh, it can be very dramatic, uh, like with this turkey, et cetera. So backlighting where it passes through something and passes through translucent feathers, et cetera, can be quite dramatic. The more dramatic uh, thoughts about backlighting is when you have a silhouette. And what's important about a silhouette is that you have a light behind the subject that's often colorful. Uh, its shape is the only thing you need to identify it. In other words, you don't need any detail off of the face, the, the shadowed face of the subject. You can recognize the subject by its outline alone. I know that's one of the larger herons and it's got a fish. If it walks forward, however, into another shadowed area, what happens? He merges into it. So that's something to really watch for when you're doing uh, silhouettes. So down here, everything's just fine. Here, it could be a little bit better, but they're not up against this here. But when you get to this picture here, we got a glob. Uh, so you want to make sure that your silhouettes uh, separate from each other, uh, that you pick a good angle to shoot at. I shot from a very low position, flipsy back again, flat on the ground here, because if I had stood up and just taken the picture, basically, this is an exaggeration, but this is what I would have had. I would have had half land and half bird, uh, and it wouldn't be nowhere near as nice as this picture that was taken from flat on the ground. These are two other pictures that I've pulled from my uh, Badlands program, um, but they're two very nice examples of silhouettes where, I mean, the, the, the foot up and so forth, they are definitely, in this case, not merging with the ground below them. Uh, here we've got even a little bit of uh, rim light uh, adding to the silhouette for some nice images. Looking in the direction of the sunset, the sunrise isn't always the best place to look. You want to make sure that you take a look up at the sky. You look behind you. You look and see if any of the clouds are catching some of the beautiful light that's coming from the sunset. That's what I did in this case. It's a wood stork. It was taken in Florida. Um, and this was in the opposite direction than the sunset, uh, but the clouds were just glowing. And so it made for a very nice picture. Here, we've got some of the warm light. You've got some warm light on the clouds, et cetera. It just is not in the direction of the sunset, but still very nice. When you get into the area of like maybe fog in the picture, that's not a big deal. Uh, that could be very nice for a picture. It could be very moody shot. We've got a little spotlighting here with the storm and rainbow, nice. We got some storm clouds here, nice. Uh, but when you get into a situation like this, this is not my favorite. Um, when I have a very overcast sky, what I end up with was the gray sky. I end up if there's water below, it's gray water. If it's a bird on the water, he just blends right into it as, the, as do these uh, black skimmers blend into the background. We can't really see the vibrant 
orange or red of the bills of these skimmers uh, because the light's just not striking them. It's a very flat image and they're blending into the background. And besides that, because there's not a lot of light, you don't have a very fast shutter speed as well. That's a big difference between that picture and this picture of the American widgeon here. There was a little bit of sunlight and it just brought out the beautiful iridescent feathers of this bird. The speed, uh, shutter speed was fast enough to catch the action of him feeding. I had a blue sky with some clouds, white clouds. It gave you some beautiful reflections in the water. And I like that a whole lot better than I did in this picture of the widgeon, even though his wings are up, et cetera, you're just missing some of those elements. Um, this guy here is a glossy ibis. And glossy ibis often to me almost look black. Um, but with the right amount of sunlight and the right time of year, which happens to be breeding season, uh, he has some beautiful colors that I never noticed before. And if you have black subjects, like I had a black cocker spaniel and I had a heck of a time ever getting a great picture of it because it just looked like this flat black blob. Uh, if you have a black subject, look for highlights. Uh, that are getting picked up in the fur or the feathers, um, both of the stuck here. And then we've got uh, this crow uh, here where the highlights are really giving definition to the bird. Without that, all you have is you would have just a black, just like this little patch here. Um, light that's kind of contrast. This The top picture is just horrible. Uh, the light's pretty strong. Mom's got her head down. Junior is behind mom. That's not helping anything. Um, whereas the picture on the left below, we've got some nice interaction. We've got some light overcast. Uh, we've got some definition in both the mom and junior. And the other one, this is my favorite girl. Um, I call her Cinnamon. Um, this was late in the afternoon. I hope to see her again. Uh, late in the afternoon with nice warm light as she's coming out of the woods. This was in North Carolina, which is where one of the largest concentration of black bear are in the eastern, U uh, e yeah, eastern U.S. Okay, up in the corner, I have a picture of a heron and it's fishing and I'm going, oh good, it's got a fish, it's got rings of water, that, oh, it's got a reflection, isn't that all? And it's got, you can see the fish. And then I started looking at the picture and I'm going, eh, it's so hot. I don't like where the shadows are falling. I don't like that sharp cut across the neck of the bird where the shadow is. And I much prefer the lower image where we've got the sparkling water, where we've got a sharp uh, subject. The Any shadows are actually showing some definition to the body. It's not hurting anything. And certainly this one is a better picture. I. Don't use flash very often. Um, it's just, it's extra to carry around. Uh, it can be disruptive with some subjects, some subjects not so. Um, but this was, uh, I had the flash off to the side. It was a fill flash. And when another hummingbird would approach this one, it would raise the feathers. And when it raised the feathers, you got all these beautiful iridescent feathers. This was a rainy overcast day but that extra little splash of light that I had from my flash off to the side uh, really made the image. And then I started playing around with something recently. I, I had a, down at Assateague, I had a horse fight and it, it was a great horse fight, and, but the sky was white. It wasn't blue sky, it wasn't very nice, didn't have anything going for it. And so I said, okay, let's see what happens if I turn it into a black and white, and I did. And all of a sudden I discovered as I played with it that, oh, I like the way uh, you've got the texture of the fur. These uh, horses uh, live on a barrier island. It's a very uh, cold and windy environment and they have fairly thick fur. They're a little shorter and so forth also to adapt to that environment. Uh, but that picture really shows that. And then I started playing around with some other things. So it uh, Tangier, I happened to catch this one and I turned it into a black and white. This one, I saw this branch sitting in the water and I said, wouldn't it be nice if something came to it? And every day that I'd go by that little branch, I'd look at it and nothing was there until one day I did get a heron there. So that was kind of nice. And then I played some more with uh, partial black and white, we'll say. Um, this was the first one I did. I just, I thought, 
when I saw the image, um, when I saw what was happening, I, I, I automatically sort of converted it into this. Um, but I have enjoyed playing around. This is my most recent one, and I really like it. Um, but um, playing around with some of the images and not totally being, you know, straight, realistic, et cetera. These are a little bit more uh, interior design type things that you might put on a wall, uh, et cetera. So I'll play a little bit more with this as I go along. When I see a subject, I got to decide, why did I stop and look at it? Why well, don't want to take a picture of it? What, what's important to me? If I don't know what is important to me, I can't show you what I, I'm thinking about it. So I can't do much with the image. Uh, so what was important was this was down in uh, North Carolina, down in the Outer Banks, uh, near Bonner Bridge. Actually, I remember where I took it. And it was a little, it was a small ghost crab. But what really was remarkable about it is how its markings on its backs and its legs all match the sand. And also how he had these eye stalks that made him look like some kind of little Martian. Uh, so when I took the picture, I wanted to make sure that both of those characteristics showed up. And the eye stalks are very sharp. I've got a little bit of highlight on them, um, et cetera. And so it came across the way that I wanted it to. Backgrounds are important. And you can get into an area where you've got the most wonderful action, but it's a little hard to make out what's going on just because of all that's going on in the background. You can't do a whole lot about it. And this would be very difficult to separate out. Um, I'd prefer a background that, that is smoother. Uh, we'll talk about these two in a second. This one I just played around with just recently and I really like, um, this is a, a, a male uh, belted kingfisher, but I love the fact kicking the water up the wing just touching the water as this sandhill crane is taking off. You can see the yellow feet and the fish. Uh, so this nice background, plain background, well, you could see the characteristics. You can see uh, the crest on the, the kingfisher. I like some of the other shots, the background was so bad uh, with a lot of uh, bush bushes and twigs and whatever. He did a beautiful wing spread. Uh, he just stretched that wing and showed all the pattern and so forth, but it was almost impossible to extract it out um, and get a decent picture with it. These two I put in here, this one was taken, I was in a blind actually, and, um, and it was not too long after the sunrise and the sun was just hitting the ground. I had to lighten up on the tail a little bit in post-processing, but it was just perfect hitting the fox and it didn't light up the background, which was wonderful because in this case, which might be half hour later, maybe even only 15 minutes later, the background is certainly distracting compared uh, with the titmouse. In terms of, uh oh, I just lost the top of my water. Anyway, um, in terms of composition, you all hear the whole thing about uh, there's rules. Well, they're not really rules, they're suggestions, uh, they're guidelines, you know, don't center subjects, don't cut off part of subjects, rule of thirds, uh, odd numbers are preferred over even, because if you have even, lots of times you got something on one side of the frame and something on the other side of the frame and it divides it, et cetera. Um, and these are all nice guidelines. And in this case, I cut off part of the wings and it's sort of centered and I don't care because I like it. Um, this guy, however, is kind of a boring picture. If I had a little more detail on the bird, uh, I could have maybe cropped it so that it wasn't in the center. But right now that thing, that little guy uh, is in the center of the frame and that's certainly not as interesting. It's a little bit static. When you get to him, he's sort of in the center, but there's a sense of power there with, with those two uh, horns coming around. And Junior down here, Mr. Oh, darn it. Mr. Raccoon, I don't think I want to mess with him. He's got the look. Now it's kind of centered, uh, but I don't mind it because it has a sense of power. The same thing, we've got a centered head of this osprey, but who cares? I love the wings. I love the splashing of the water. I love the reflection of the water. There's nothing wrong with it. And then cutting off of something, parts of something, well, I cut off part of the snake. Yes, it, you can see from the elliptical eye, 
uh, slits here that this is a viper and you can see a little rattle tail. Um, it's a rattler, but what I wanted out of it was I love the swirls and I love the pattern. And so I didn't need the whole snake to get that. Just like with this eagle, I just love the way the, the wings frame that head and you could see the structure of that bill and how sharp it is. And in the case of this guy down here, this is your um, a, yeah, black skimmer. Uh, and I, did, I really want to emphasize the bill. So I didn't bother the tips of the wings not being there. I purposely didn't uh, have them in the picture because the skimmer is a very unusual bird that the longer, the lower mandible is longer than the top. And that's how he skims along the water. He skims along the water, hits a fish, and then that snaps shut and he captures he captures the fish. Another thing I keep in mind when I'm shooting is I want things to be going into the frame, not out of the frame in most cases. And that's the case here. They're entering the frame. That's the case here. He's looking into the frame and I just love the colors on this. Um, again, there's some actual imaginary use of space. There's a sense of movement, et cetera. I usually leave more room for something above it or where it's heading and looking uh, because there's an implied use of space. And in this case, uh, it really makes you, the, just the position of the fox, et cetera, in the eyes makes you wonder what it's looking at, as well as you're wondering what those cheetahs have got in their sights. So there's more room, again, on the side that they're looking uh, towards. This guy I did, I left more room in the back. I did it because I liked I liked the wake that the little uh, pied bill grebe was making. Uh, didn't have to do it this way, could have done it the other way, but this was what I wanted to emphasize. So I gave him space. I watch out for things blending in to the backgrounds. Um, these sandhill cranes, as soon as they got in front of that tree, they were lost. I worry about things merging together where you, you lose the head of one subject or you have extra legs that you shouldn't have because one bird's behind or one animal's behind another. I much prefer the flow and just, there's a beautiful flow to these going over the trees uh, and they're not blocking each other. I don't like things that are flying away from you. I don't like it when you get the belly of whatever it is totally in shadow, particularly the head. I always try to, try to get some sunlight, a position of the subject that there's some sunlight on the face. Again, flying away, flying out of the frame. Uh -uh. None of these thrill me. This one goes to what I was talking about with the heron. Um, just watch out for cutting off feet. Uh, leave room for where you, I can't see the feet here, but I got a feeling about where they are. Uh, and so I'm gonna leave a little space for him to stand on. I'm not gonna cut off the tip of his tail. This image is much more complete and feels much better and realistic than this one over here. And it pulls you out of the frame among other things. Um, out of focus foreground is also a bit of a problem. Um, it often draws the eye away from the subject. In the case of the turkey, uh, it's actually covering up the feet, which I don't, I'm not thrilled with, nor am I thrilled with the fact that the shorebird has lost his feet as well because of a rise in the sand in front of where the bird is. Um, in the case of this guy, I did crop him. Uh, the important part really was what he was doing. Uh, so I did do a crop on him uh, and didn't worry about this. This guy here, the roadrunner, it was an interesting shot. Um, because it shows the characteristics of birds that I'm not, I didn't believe happened. Um, I was, it was in South Texas and I was actually out of the car on the ground along a two track that he was on and I was trying to get a picture of him. And all of a sudden he walks towards me and I'm going, okay, I'll take pictures. Yeah, I got some out of focus foreground but it's a beautiful frame around him. And besides that, it illustrates the point that if you're, acting in a behavior that's non-threatening, that they don't feel that you're, you're out to get them. Um, curiosity can be your friend. Eyes, eyes are the windows to the soul, as they say, and it's certainly important in photographs. In photographs, you certainly want the eyes to be sharp, highlight in the eye is good. The nice uh, lit portion here, the contrast here really draws you into the eyes 
of this raccoon who does not look overly exactly friendly. Uh, the fox over there has the look in his eye of, <laughs> I'm a sly fox. Um, so having the eye sharp is important. If the eyes aren't sharp, the rest of the image is not going to look sharp. Then you run into problems where you're using autofocus a lot. And the autofocus goes, I don't care about the eye. I'm going to get that grass. That's the first thing it hits. Um, and when you run into that problem, I took, remember I said a refine. I looked at my image and I'm going, wait a minute, the eye isn't sharp. Uh, and what I ended up doing was I let it quickly autofocus on the grass and then I manually very rapidly focused on the eye. And I did it in both of these cases. This little guy is kind of framed. This was also down in North Carolina. Uh, but my interest was not in the tree. It was in the eyes of this little curious fellow. I use continuous autofocus. I take a burst of shots. In other words, I take a high number of frames per second in terms of shots because I'm following along with these guys. The first set of pictures I get might look like this. They close their eyes. I didn't notice that while I was taking the picture. Little further along, oh, their eyes are open. Not only that, they're kind of closer together in terms of distance from the camera. So they're all within the depth of field. They're very sharp, uh, et cetera. So um, taking and putting the camera on continuous autofocus where it follows the subject and having a large number of frames per second can be very helpful in capturing exactly what you're looking for. Even with still subjects, even with stationary subjects, I will usually take more than one shot. The reason is, is things can happen. <sighs> Sorry again. Things can happen. The eye can blink. There's a nictane, there's a thin membrane that can come down over the eye often when they scratch. Uh, that membrane comes down and the eye is clouded and you want to wait until that clears. Sometimes it's just a tilt of the head, uh, as we have over here, that the eye's in shadow. Sometimes one picture is just a little sharper than the other. I got the, the um, maybe it didn't move as much. Um, maybe my, my focus was just a little bit better. Um, so I usually take more than one shot. Also, it's great for getting, I got a dancer, I've got stretcher here. Um, in terms of focusing points, this one, uh, if you've got the chance on your, and we'll have to put some separation now here between mirrorless and non-mirrorless cameras. And your DLSLR cameras, a lot of them have uh, a single point uh, focus sensor. You can just do the eye, uh, you can do some other things. Uh, if you can get it just on the eye and there's nothing interfering, great. You can follow along with it. Uh, but you got to move to keep that square over the eye. You got a flying bird. Uh, Nikon had a group arrangement that you could uh, put over the eye. It also had uh, what was called a dynamic area uh, where it looked, if the subject moved a little bit, the focusing points would adjust for that. Uh, today, you've got something that I love. Animal eye detection autofocus comes with a lot of the newer uh, mirrorless cameras, among other things. Uh, and so when the subject moves, that sensor just stays right on the eye. Once you have it on the eye, it stays on the eye. And if the subject's moving, it just follows it along. Uh, there's different uh, modes of that operating, but that's kind of the general gist of it. That's what I used uh, in the case of this oyster catcher. I locked on the eye. Uh, there's a couple different ways the Nikon has. You can, you can have a square that you put over top of the eye area and then it, it zaps, it goes right in and picks the eye up. And as the bird is moving, it's keeping the sensor right there on the eye. Uh, and that can be extremely helpful. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, sometimes it goes off into the background. There's something of high contrast in the background or spots that it happens to lock on to. And in those cases, and I've seen other people have to do this too, and there may be changes in new firmware, uh, but sometimes I have to quickly manually get it close to where it ought to be, and then it'll lock in on my subject. There's something also, uh, it was in Olympus cameras earlier on, and now it's in a number of uh, some of the mirrorless cameras. It's a pre-release burst mode. In other words, the camera, uh, if you've got something that's getting ready to jump or move uh, and you want to 
capture that movement, the camera, when you're pushing the shutter button partway down, the camera is capturing images in the buffer. And it'll capture them for a specified amount of time, depending on what you tell it. Uh, and then when you push the shutter all the way down, it takes that specified amount of time worth of images that are in the buffer and records them. Um, so you can catch things that you know are jumping off of something or getting ready to fly or whatever that you normally would have missed because you were a little too slow uh, hitting the shutter. Now, uh, you, with this pre-release burst, um, some of the part of the action that's been stored in the buffer becomes recorded. And that's really nice. I haven't done a whole lot with that, but I will be. Um, talk a little bit about uh, where you ought to be in terms of your subject. And I mentioned it earlier. If you can be eye level with the subject, lots of times you get a background that's uh, more out of focus, which is good. The you know, subject stands out, it's not as distorted. You know, shooting down at a child from standing up, you're going to get like a big head and so forth out of proportion. Uh, and it's also a little bit more intimate a shot. The only thing I can't figure out with this picture is how in the heck he ate that cactus. I will not know or why. And this is just another example of a background that came from number one being low uh, eye level. But uh, also, if your aperture is pretty wide open, you're going to have a shallow depth of field. So you've got a better chance of uh, eliminating details in the background, having a smoother background. If you've got a lot of magnification, you get less depth of field. So less around the subject in front of and behind it is going to be in focus. So you got a better chance of getting a smoother background. Uh, and the closer you are to the subject compared to the background, the better off you are in getting that smooth background as well. But I don't always shoot from eye level. This guy, I if I'd done that, I'd have a whole bunch of nests, mud nests in the background and a whole bunch of other baby albatross in the background and some adults. And I didn't want that. Uh, so to get a clean background with the sky and so forth, which is where he's going to spend most of his time with that nice long wing, uh, he's going to spend most of his life out over the water and doesn't come to land to breed. And this all kind of shows that. And you can talk about it. Also, being at a higher angle is good for reflections, particularly if you've got a nice windless day, that's a real help. Uh, and in all these cases, that turned out fairly nice. Uh, if you get down too low, you may clip part of the reflection. Uh, this one I was very pleased with. I just got this year. I almost blocked somebody else's shot. Be careful. Um, I was shooting something on the other side of the road. I spotted this. I pulled up, and all of a sudden, I realized that there was somebody across the street from me that was also trying to shoot this. So I backed up. Be courteous to your fellow photographers. But I really like, um, particularly, I love the reflections and also uh, the bird that just landed and it's kind of like leading the band, sort of. Um, so this is one of my favorite shots. What lenses do I use? What do lenses do? Telephoto lenses magnify and they help isolate. So we've isolated uh, the part of the flamingo that I really liked. We talked about zeroing in on what you care about a subject. I cared about all those beautiful curves, the curve of the neck, the curve of the curves around the eye, the curves of the bill, the curves of the feathers, etc. Um, but not only do long lenses isolate and magnify, but they also compress uh, space. They make things in the background look larger and they make distances look closer. So that heron, uh, which his eye color, uh, breeding eye color is nicely matched to the poles that are there. Uh, those poles are probably five feet apart, yet he looked like he can barely pass through them. But the nice thing about this compression is you can get the feeling of crowding, like the crowd of these cows that are kind of mad at me because I'm in their way. Uh, my blind was kind of sitting near where they were and they weren't real happy. They would go running past me and turn around and run past me again and then turn around and stare at me. And I took a picture because I figured if they killed me, uh, somebody would know what did it. And then they got curious and started sticking their heads inside of the blind. And I'd probably be better off with them running. So anyway, but uh, long telephoto lenses help compress and create the crowd feeling. They also have a narrow angle of view, which means that you can move just slightly. If you've got something in the background that you don't like behind the subject, a slight shift uh, in your position may help immensely in terms of what you have as a background. And that happened in both of these places. In the case of this one, I did have one or two spots that I had to take care of. 
uh, in terms of they were a little bright and I got rid of them. When you have a long lens, when you magnify and isolate a lot and you have a limited depth of field, you end up with a problem that sometimes you see a subject out there flying and you see it and you try to get the lens to focus on it and you can't find it. Uh, the narrow angle of view, the, the depth of field, the limited depth of field are all fighting against you. So there's a couple things you can do about it. Some lenses have an adjustment on them that they can be adjusted that they're, they're set up for, for more distant shots. Uh, they don't go from five feet away to infinity. They're going from a distance out to infinity. Uh, another thing can help is to focus on something that is about the same distance away as they are maybe on the water below or on a tree line or whatever and then swing up and uh, you'll see the bird and it'll lock focus on it. Uh, really what you're doing is just getting some of the lens elements closer to where they need to be to be able to focus on the subject. And uh, zoom lenses, you can start with a wider view and then zoom in to increase magnification, that can help. If you wanna practice, I suggest if you're gonna do a lot of flying birds and moving birds and trying to find birds and get them in focus, et cetera. You might want to go to your local zoo, local pond, uh, local garbage dump where there's lots of seagulls flying around, but they're good places to practice your autofocus skills and your skills on capturing flying subjects. Okay, this little guy. And apparently Great Falls, I think, had one of these. I just saw something on TV about it. Uh, it's a little painted bunning. It's a very teeny little bird. Excuse me, one minute. Headphones are kind of hurting my ears. Um, I shot this with a 600 millimeter lens. It was a large lens uh, with a 1.4 teleconverter. That means that you have a device that goes between the camera body and the lens that helps you magnify. Uh, and it certainly helped make this image bigger uh, in the frame. Uh, if I went to a smaller sensor, it would even be larger in the frame, although less pixels. But the bottom line is teleconverters, there were 1.4 teleconverters, which were fairly good. And there were doublers that doubled the focal length of your lens. So you had a 300 that acted like a six. And that was all well and good, but they weren't very sharp with the DLSLR lenses. Um, and also they had a a nasty habit. Now, a 1.4 teleconverter will drop your light in half. In other words, if you have a 200th of a second, it'll drop your shutter speed to 100th of a second. The doublers will drop it twice, so it'll drop it, it'll quarter it. So if you had 250th of a second, it drops from 250 to 125 to 60. So now you've got a 60th of a second shutter speed instead of the 250. So it cuts down on your amount of light. And the doublers were not as sharp as the 1.4 teleconverters. But with the advent, with the arrival of mirrorless cameras, I couldn't believe it. They said that the teleconverters were much better than the old ones, and they certainly are. I've been using a 70 to 200 millimeter lens with a doubler on the back end of it uh, for some birds and flight shots. And it's easy to handhold. It's not as heavy as, as a big long lens. Uh, it can reach basically with a doubler, it can reach up to 400 millimeters uh, and it is extremely sharp. And if you don't have a long lens and you wanna know if you wanna do this type of bird photography or little things, uh, you can rent lenses like, uh, Baltimore, we have service photo, I'm sure. I think maybe district is down in, in DC. But some of your pro uh, camera stores, you really want to support them and not do everything th through the big like mail-ins um, because these guys will help you with your cameras. They know a lot and you don't want them to disappear. Um, zoom lenses in the old days, again, they weren't quite as sharp as they are now. They are sharper. I have a two to 500 millimeter Nikon even with an adapter for mirrorless, it is very sharp. Downside of it, good side, it's versatile. I can be in a blind or in a vehicle, uh, in a safari vehicle and get the whole pride of lions as well as maybe just one lion uh, with the one lens. Downside is they're usually heavier. They're usually a little bit slower in terms of maximum aperture. In other words, instead of it being an F4 lens, it might be an F5.6 max, maximum aperture. And the other thing is, uh, is they're 
often a little slower catching autofocus. I do do I do use other lenses if I want an environmental shot like at Zion. I want to show how uh, these desert bighorn can climb these incredible slopes or the large volume birds that are going to go over top of you at uh, this is a Bosque in, in New Mexico. Uh, one of the farm ponds, which right now I understand they are dry and this is not happening as well. Also another environmental shot. So I don't do just tight shots, but I try to show some of the environment. Tripods. Yeah, I use tripods a lot. Um, I'm not I'm not super strong. Um, and one of the other things is if you've got slow shutter speeds, they do help. They help uh, your focus be more precise. You can take it's still so you can look around the edges of the lens you can do a little bit better in terms of composition but certainly a lot of people are hand holding the lenses now that the cameras and the lenses both have image stabilization within them um, so with some of the shorter combinations i can deal with it with something that's fairly long i'm not the 600 millimeter i could not hand hold even though it's got the uh image stabilization in both the cameras and the um and the lens a um, couple comments on, on the tripods themselves. You want one that is lightweight. You want one that you can ship easily in your luggage. So if you've got a duffel bag, it fits. Uh, you want something that's sturdy and quick to set up. You don't want it to collapse on you while you're standing there shooting with a big long lens, which I've had a problem recently and mine's off to get seen by the uh, tripod doctor. <laughs> um, I had problems with my Gitsu tripods, and this is a really right stuff, and I've had problems with it, and I've sent it off to them to get that fixed uh, because it's very awkward. Uh, you want to look at how low they can go to the ground. I don't want a center post in mine because if you elevate the center post to get the height you need, uh, that is just making this tripod less stable. You want the tripod to come fully to uh, give you a camera at eye level without having any kind of center post that you've got to extend. Uh, okay, and whether or not you turn on image stabilization when you're using a tripod is really dependent on the camera and the lens. And you need to check with your manufacturer about that. Sometimes putting the stabilization on will decrease the sharpness of the image. Quick run through on exposure. Um, and the shoe pretty much all know, but I'll throw out a couple of things that might be useful. Uh, one of the questions I always get asked is uh, how fast your shutter speed have to be for moving birds, for flying birds. And it really, it all depends on the bird. But in a lot of cases, the general rule of thumb is around a 2,000th of a second is a pretty good guess. But if you have a smaller bird that's real close to you, that's crossing the frame horizontally, uh, that's moving very fast like a hummingbird, then you might want a 4,000th of a second. By the way, this is a good time to be using that pre-release burst mode where you're starting to uh, build up pictures in the buffer before you actually push the shutter all the way down. So hummingbirds, the fourth, this one was taken at a 4,000th of a second. This is this bird's really moving fast. So it's gonna be at least a 4,000th of a second as well. Uh, this was just magnifying a lot. Uh, and the more I magnified, the higher that shutter speed just really needed to be uh, because I'm magnifying any motion of that subject and of the camera. But you can get away with slow shutter speed. Sometimes you have birds that just sit there, and that one was taken at about a 300th of a second. And I can use a lower ISO with it so I can get better tones and better control of color, et cetera. This guy is not flying as fast as, say, that hummingbird. So you might be able to get away with a 1500th of a second as a shutter speed. You got to experiment a little bit. The further they are away, the less you're magnifying, the slower your shutter speed can be, and they could still be sharp. They could, these could be still sharp at a thousandth of a second. But sometimes you want the shutter speed to blur action. So like the wings here, it was taken at a 200th of a second. This one, I was just sort of playing around with a little bit of panning and also a slow shutter speed for sort of an artistic effect. So you don't have to have everything super sharp. Um, the other part, uh, or one of the other parts of exposure or main part is your f-stop or lens opening. Uh, <clears throat> low f numbers are your big lens openings. It's kind of ass backwards of what you would think. Um, so low numbers, big lens openings. That means that if I have a subject that is moving some, 
I probably want to be operating at that lower number uh, because I'm going to be getting faster shutter speeds. <clears throat> also, at low F numbers, you're also getting less depth of field, which could be good or bad. Uh, in the case of this uh, yellow rumped warbler, uh, the background is great. He's sharp, no problem. Uh, shallow depth of field, didn't bother it at all. And in the case of the frog, I just zeroed in on the eyes and made sure that most of the rest of the frog was, was out, cause out of focus because the eyes are what was the most important. If you have multiple subjects, then you run into problems that, okay, if I open the lens all the way up, I have a very shallow depth of field. Okay, I have several animals and they are at different distances away from the camera. Okay, then you have to consider raising your uh, F number. In other words, I might shoot this at F16. I might have to raise my ISO a little bit to be able to have the shutter speed I need. Remember that basically three things control that exposure, F-stop, uh, your shutter speed and your ISO, your sensitivity your, of your sensor to light. Uh, so in the case of these raccoons and, and these other guys, I might have used F11, F16 uh, to make sure that they were all in focus. And the closer they are in terms of distance from me to the camera or from, excuse me, my camera from them, from the face of the camera to, to the line that I have to have sharp, um, the more parallel, the better. In other words, maybe saying that a better way is if you're doing macro photography, you have very shallow depth of field. It may be millimeters, maybe less than that. What you need to do is line the face of the lens up with the area that you need sharp. And in this case, it was this, back, this wing, the eye, proboscis. Uh, even here with a lot of magnification, this is a very small shorebird, a sanderling. I didn't have much depth of field, so I had to be very careful that I lined up the face of the lens, my angle of view, that I had it totally parallel uh, to the eye and the surfaces that I wanted sharp. They had to be equal distant from uh, the lens face. Okay, ISO is sort of like grain and film, but not really. It's an ampl ampl amplification. Sorry, I'm not saying too good right now. It amplifies the signal uh, and you get noise. And that noise appears as something that almost looks like the grain that you used to get uh, with, um, with film. The higher you go in the highest ISO, the more chance you have of picking up this quote unquote amplified noise. Uh, this was this fox picture was taken uh, at it was a what it was an ISO of 3200, uh, and it was lens was wide open for this particular lens, and you can see that there's there's some uh, grain in the background that I don't really like. Uh, I can do a little bit about it in either Photoshop or Lightroom uh, to one of the main Adobe processing programs, but there's also a what's called a plugin that works with those two uh, particular uh, software programs. And it's called Topaz Denoise AI. And they have one for sharpening, it's a sharpen AI. But the bottom line is AI, artificial intelligence. It does a wonderful job of taking care of the noise in the background and the subject is still sharp. So you get a much better separation of this fox on the background than that one. This is where a lot of people just sort of disagree or agree. I do use aperture priority. I use one of two auto modes. Mainly I use aperture priority if I'm gonna use an automatic mode for exposure. In other words, I will set the f-stop. I will set what I think the ISO should be. This is in the case here, we've got nice evenly lit scene got enough sun on it, but the sun might be going up and down. So my exposure is going to be changing a little bit, but it's pretty even exposure all the way across the frame. I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, well, let me start off at 400 ISO. And I got the lens almost wide open. Oh, it's not fast enough. I think my little squirrel is going to move around a little bit. I might have to bump up my ISO a little higher. Um, if I've got something that I need a lot of depth of field, I'll think about starting with the f-stop being high, check the shutter speed to see if it's fast enough, bump the ISO if I have to. Um, 
but it works well. It's just fine for a situation like this. Other people use what's called auto ISO. It is also an automatic exposure mode. You pick two things, shutter speed, f-stop. The camera selects the ISO that it picks. In other words, the sensitivity of that sensor. And you can set how high it goes. So you can set the limit on it. So a lot of people use this. The only thing I can say about both of these is if you have a background that's quite different, your subject's moving from one light situation into another, the background's very different as in this case with this marmot, uh, automatic exposure modes can trip you up. Um, you need to be careful with them. Uh, so a lot of people will go to manual exposure. They will set everything. They will set the f-stop, the shutter speed, and the ISO. And they will take a reading, a light meter reading, instead of using maybe uh, matrix metering or whatever, they might pick spot metering. And they're going to take a reading off of the marmot. And they are going to set their exposure, their f-stop, ISO, uh, shutter speed, according to that. And then they can recompose the picture however they want, but it's going to hold that setting. So if they didn't do that, if it was on an automatic exposure mode, whether it was aperture priority, shutter priority, or ISO uh, priority, the problem would be that, shoot, again, sorry, 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 back, one more. Problem would be that the camera would see all this dark background. If it's looking at the whole frame and making exposure settings based on this whole frame, maybe this was real white in the background. Uh, it would cause the same kind of problem, but this is real dark. Camera says, oh, what I'm looking at is going to be middle tone. Remember the old gray card that you used to hold up or green grass or brown dirt? That was that average. Well, the camera's going to say, oh, I'm looking at an average scene and oh, it's real dark. It's not getting a whole lot of light on it. I'm going to add some light and your poor little marmot's going to be washed out. If the background was white, it would go in the opposite direction. So a lot of people, we use manual exposure either all the time uh, or they'll use it for certainly for situations like this. Okay, hunter versus photographer. Got a lot of similarities. We use a lot of the similar get-ups. Maybe we use camouflage clothing. This is what's called a ghillie suit. Um, you could sit up against a tree and be pretty invisible with it, with it kind of wrapped around you and the camera and so forth. Um, You've got to know something about animal behavior. Uh, you might use a blind instead of something like this. You've got to know something maybe about signs like game trails, et cetera, roosting sites, scrapes, and uh, rubs. Um, the uh, yeah, sheep, bighorn sheep and so forth will often gravitate towards some kind of mineral lake. Uh, also buffaloes roll in the dirt. So there'll be dusting areas that some birds use certain dusting areas, some of the grouse and so forth. Uh, so these are some things that if you know about them, it helps you find the animals. You can also use decoys, cover sense if you've got something that has a good sense of smell. You can bait with corn or a salt lick, like if you've got a deer, salt lick might or corn uh, might be okay. Game calls, uh, you could use those, you know, turkey hunters use turkey calls all the time. These are all well and good, but you've got to be careful where you're using them because federal property isn't your property. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's against the rules and regulations of that particular area to be able to use bait, blinds, et cetera. So you need to check on regulations. Private property is a different story. Major difference between a hunter and a photographer happens to be distance. A hunter can shoot something 200 yards away and get it. We're not going to be shooting at those distances. In fact, further away your animal is from you, the more problems you're going to have with sharpness because you're going to be dealing with dust. You're going to be dealing with haze. You're dealing with heat ripple. I've been starting to see uh, there could be mist, fog, moisture in the air, uh, all sorts of things that can decrease image sharpness. So. OK, we have to be closer to our animal. How are we going to do that? Well, we could use the blind and that ghillie suit. And that's, uh, that's concealment. And we could get away with that. That's one thing we could do. And it has applications in limited places. Uh, or we're going to have to depend on the animal basically accepting us as part of the environment. Uh, and I do do that a lot. What do you do to do that? You emulate the movements of the subject. You keep a low profile. You move in a slow fashion, you meander, you don't make any sudden moves. You watch where the animal's going. It usually has a certain 
he he often is going in a certain direction. Uh, and if you can move in a direction that's eventually going to intersect his path, that's a good move. You don't want to turn and walk directly towards him. You don't want eye contact with him. You don't want to make a lot of noise in terms of clanking things and so forth. You don't want things that don't fit in the environment like perfumes, like perfume snow, soaps, et cetera, shiny things. Uh, if it's an animal that has a good sense of smell, you want to move in from downwind so he can't detect you. A lot of those animals do not have a good um, vision. Uh, I, ha I had a uh, taper walk within, I swear, 20 feet of me. I, I just froze. I see this big thing coming. This was in uh, Argentina. Big gray fella. And he never saw me. Uh, I didn't move. He didn't see me. He didn't smell me. And I said, oh, great. That's a good thing. Uh, photographing from the water. You get a lot better acceptance from animals, either kayak or um, possibly um, just wading in the water, using canoe, using a floating blind, all these things will help uh, you be accepted more by the animal than you would otherwise. Things you don't want to do, ethical behavior. You do not want to stress an animal. You don't want to uh, limit his life, uh, length of his life. Uh, you want to, for him to be comfortable to go back doing whatever he was doing when you showed up. Um, so, you don't want to chase after an animal. You might move in on an animal a little bit, and he might move away a little bit, but then he goes back to chewing on the, on the vegetation, and that's all well and good. But if he keeps moving off from you, you moved in, he moved off, you move in again, he moved off, uh-uh, that's done, you're done. Uh, you don't want to move at him quickly. Uh, you don't want to, in other words, I've seen people chase after him. Uh, you don't want to feed uh, wild animals because you don't want them to become dependent on people and come up to people and then get in trouble. Uh, you don't want to clap or do anything to wave your arms or disturb them. Uh, you want to be respectful of other people in the field as well and don't block their view. Uh, you need to be very careful or you could get in a lot of trouble with an animal that becomes very perturbed. You want to pay attention to signs like you saw it wasn't a disturbed sign that you saw with that fox a while ago, but the ears up, um, the eyes very alert, et cetera. Um, some, sometimes there's tail action, sometimes they roll their eyes. Uh, elk thrash at things, uh, deer might stomp. All these things are signs that they ain't happy with you and you better back off. How do I find animals? Well, one of the things is in any environment, if you can see something that's out of place, color, shape, uh, tone, it doesn't belong in that environment, it helps you spot the animal there. I can spot this rabbit in Texas under these conditions. I take that same rabbit, put him out in uh, the Badlands, and I'm going to have a different set of parameters to look for. I've become a very good spotter if I've been in an area for maybe a day or two, because I get used to what I'm going to see in that environment. And if there's something out of place, I'll notice it. Um, knowing where animals hang out, like if you're going to the Badlands, the little ones, the little uh, bighorn sheep, they like to hang out at a place called Pinnacles Overlook. Now, whether they're still doing that or not, I don't know, but they had been there the last couple of springs. Uh, you know that shorebirds are, if they are following waves, they're going to go out with the wave and they're going to come back in as the wave comes in after them because they don't want to get washed over. These uh, two quail down here, that was that Bosque del Apache, it was near a feeder, but it was also near an area that was a dusting area for the birds. So that was one place to set up. But I happened to, I could park the car in a place where I knew they crossed a little section of open ground. And the one day I was sitting there and I, I tried it on a couple of cases. Sometimes I got nothing, uh, but I happened to notice the one male coming down the hill and the other one that was out on the flat, he turns around and he sees the other male coming down and he turns and starts heading towards the, the intruder, shall we say. Uh, I know when I see something like that, I bet you action's gonna happen. So I'm zeroing in uh, on the birds. The squirrel there, he had a habit. He went up the tree, he knocked down the pine cone, he'd come down the tree, he'd pick up the pine cone, he'd go hide it, and he'd repeat this over and over again. It took about the same path. So it made it easy. So habits uh, that animals repeat can be very helpful. 
uh, I check places where I expect to find them, high places like on posts, the eagles, hawks, etc., like high points of view for being able to see prey. Um, the uh, kingfishers, they like dead snags, uh, open branches. So I look there on a regular basis. This was in, um, this was also in Badlands. Uh, I think it's a green violet uh, swallow. Anyhow, they nest in crevices uh, in the, um, uh, well, in the walls of the of the cliffs, uh, in the holes in the cliffs. So uh, they would often would sit someplace before they went into the nest. Same thing happens with swallows. Uh, they might perch someplace or another bird may perch someplace and then go to the nest. Um, and this little guy, I would just look up again for perches and things and I happen to spot him up there. I looked for tracks. Uh, this is from Tangier. Only mammal they have in Tangier other than cats uh, happens to be muskrat. They're muskrat traps, tra tracks. So that particular little gut, every once in a while I'd see a muskrat in it. It was a good place to look. I mentioned dusting areas. There's the donkey dusting. Uh, you'll see that periodically. The little fox, I saw the path that it routinely took. The other foxes apparently routinely took through the woods. So I set up against some bushes and got the shot till dear daddy fox or whoever was down went from me, spotted me, barked, and then this little guy ran. Uh, I look around where I know there's some dens. Uh, these guys I spotted because I saw the bushes behind them moving. And I'm going, wait a minute, those leaves are moving, but the wind's not blowing, something's back there. And I shifted the lens over and I waited and these guys came forward, which are the two little um, ground hogs or whistle, whistle pigs. I listen, um, ospreys, lots of times I'll hear them before I see them. Same thing with woodpeckers. Uh, oyster catchers have a very shrill call, even though these are Eurasian, but our American oyster catchers do too. And so you hear them and then you start looking around shallow areas where they frequently feed. Widgeons, uh, American widgeon has a really funny high pitch, doesn't quack like a duck. Uh, so you know he's coming. Also look at the uh, reaction of other animals. Uh, prairie dogs jump sometimes just for the heck of it, but sometimes they know there's an owl or a um, coyote around. I watched uh, a bunch of haw, not excuse me, a bunch of crows follow something and it was a hawk. And if they forced it to land in the tree and that's how I got the picture. Uh, often squirrels will bark where there's foxes around and I might not see the fox, but the squirrels know it's there. Decoys, some birds will, or mammals even, will come close to you trying to draw you away from their young. So if you see something behaving really oddly coming, closer to you, you might want to look around for its other pair set of uh, the other parent, or maybe and there may be a nest, there may be a young bird somewhere around. I've used blinds. I use them in places where I expect the animals to come on a regular basis, uh, feeding areas, et cetera. This here is one place. These two uh, sites were places that you could get blinds like this. You could sit in it. it it's really a neat blind that you can carry. Uh, but it might be something to use. I used, you can buy something that you're, make something you can use in the water. This one was made up uh, when I was out in Bear River, out in Utah, to get this picture. The bird just totally ignored me. This looks like a really stupid blind, but it just must have figured it was a big bush. Uh, and it had totally ignored me. It would cover up the eggs, it would go off feed, come back, uncover the eggs, and plop down on them again. I shoot from the car periodically because the car, if there's water alongside a road, uh, it's a really good place to have a quite, you might call a mobile blind as you're moving around. You see the birds moving, you can move with them. Uh, other things to support, in fact, these bean bags, you can buy them, you can make something, you can put it on the hood of the car, you can put it on the windowsill, uh, you can put it on the roof and use it. You can put it on the ground. Uh, you can also, if you don't have anything and you don't have a tripod, you can use your knees for support or put the camera against something like a post or a fence. And I mentioned I use the car as a blind for things like this, where the birds are moving back and forth and there's a road right alongside where the water is and I can move back and forth with them. 
You don't have to go to exotic places. You can go to your local zoo. This was taken at Albuquerque Zoo. Somebody told me that wild, both widgeons and wood ducks came into the zoo where they could get free food. And there were pinion birds, but they were, they were uh, wild birds. And so I got the picture there. Wherever there's a supply of food, there's a lot of activity, where there's berries, I'll look there for, for birds to get the pictures. I'll look in places where there's fresh water, uh, limited water supply. I caught him there, um, tied out. Sometimes you'll get uh, different subjects coming out. Uh, waterways, people talk about Conowingo Dam. Uh, that's a possible place to shoot because uh, any place you have spawning uh, fish coming, uh, up river at a certain time of the year is a good place that you might want to go search out and shoot. During migration times, there's places, special places. This was on Tangier and I just lucked out, but South Padre Island, High Island in Texas, and Point Pelee up in, um, up in Canada, it's a peninsula. Anytime you have a large body of water and a strong front that's slowing the birds down and making them tired, they will often do what's called fallout. They'll drop out on the trees, they'll sit, they'll rest, they'll feed, and you get some chances to get some pictures you wouldn't normally have gotten, even with shorebirds. Places that I do like to go are wildlife refuges because they are basically managed to uh, favor wildlife, they benefit wildlife. Uh, in terms of Chincoteague, they have impoundments, they lower the water in the impoundments. Uh, at the end of winter, and they create mudflats for shorebirds. They flood those areas. They create uh, a habitat for, for waterfowl. This is a staging area. This is Middle Creek. Uh, it's a wildlife management area up north of Lancaster. 78,000 snow geese last year on March 4th. It's an incredible place, but it's a staging area that they gather before they move, uh, move out, heading back to their breeding grounds. There's other places, waste reclamation facilities down in Florida. You've got places where they, you have basically treated domestic waste, but it's pumped into either a, a natural wetland or, or created one, man-made. Uh, and organisms, number one, you have plants that take up phosphorus and nitrogen uh, out of the water, whatever's left over. And then organisms grow around that and fish grow around them. And then the birds come. And some of these places, uh, they have put in boardwalks uh, down in Florida and dike roads that you can drive around. And you can get pictures of birds at fairly close range, either in nesting behavior or courtship and so forth. Last thing, predicting behavior. Bird drops its wing, sometimes it means it's going to fly, sometimes not. But watch the posture. If it has a change in posture, sandhill cranes lean before they fly. Often uh, geese will start to chatter, look around nervously, and then take off all at once. They don't always do it, but you want to be ready if you think that's going to happen with a wide angle lens. Uh, if they've been preening, they're going to shake off, either shake off the feathers or flap off any loose feathers, another possible shot. These were all done with that eye, um, animal eye tracking. Uh, I started to see this guy lean forward and I was locked on his eyes and I got pictures as he moved towards me. Same thing with these. If you got adults and you got the kids, the kids are gonna follow adults, obviously. Whenever one animal approaches another animal, either you're gonna have something friendly like these guys here or not so friendly like these guys here or like the swan that wasn't particularly happy with the other one. And the same thing oyster catchers are famous for if somebody flies in to their little group, they're not happy and they will chase it off. And another territorial flight fight. Last thing, safety, just pay attention, keep safe distance from dangerous animals. Don't surround them, don't block their way, don't uh, get in, don't corner an animal. Um, that's very important, you get killed. Uh, watch out for slippery surfaces, holes that you don't expect. Um, quicksand like mud, you can get in some real trouble and lose your equipment if you're playing around and, and going through a marsh and all of a sudden you step in a hole. Um, 
pay attention to if you're going out of the country to travel clinic, what kind of shots you should get. Lyme disease is a real problem in this area. So use some kind of insect repellent. This one is has permethrin in it and it you spray it on your clothes, not on you, uh, but it will kill ticks and ticks probably are gonna be a problem this year. Uh, of course, sunscreen, lots of water. And the bottom line is even the best photographers are not hitting 100% images. I mean, if you get, sometimes I'll go out for a day and I'm after a certain behavior and I may come home with nothing. Uh, if you don't take chances, experiment, try different things, try to refine your, your skills, et cetera. I mean, you're going to have images to throw away and you shouldn't expect anything more than that. And a lot of people are disappointed with themselves and they shouldn't be. And with that, if you see tourists surrounding a large animal like a buffalo or an elk uh, in national parks, back away, encourage others to do so because how many times have you seen reports of buffalo tossing people? or an elk ram its antlers into somebody. Uh, so national parks don't mean they're tame, the animals in the national parks. And with that, I'm gonna open up to questions. Um, no, I'm probably over time and I am. Um, again, my website is here, uh, ospreyphoto.com. My email address is here and it does not have the O on photo. It's ospreyphoto at aol.com. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing and let you guys ask any questions that you might have or things that came up in the chat that I didn't hit. Irene, this is Audrey. Thank you very much for an excellent, excellent talk. We had one question in the chat uh -huh. from Patty, and I believe, and, and she can certainly speak up, but I believe it was on the picture of the squirrel with the open mouth. She wanted to know whether you used a 100 to 400 zoom or a 400 primer, how you got that shot of the squirrel with 600. the open mouth. It was a, a 600. 600. Patty, well, did that answer your question? No, I was not lost... quite. I, no? it, wasn't, okay. it wasn't really that particular image. I was just toying with the idea of what would be best to buy first off, a 100 to 400 or a, a 400 prime. The 100 to 400 gives you a lot of flexibility. It's a little bit slower. Um, the 400 prime limits. It's a it's a hard question. The 100 to 400 gives you a lot of flexibility. So if you're going someplace and you got something large, uh, you probably don't need maybe the full 400. Uh, if you want to do small birds, you're going to need something more than that, and probably um, some kind of teleconverter on it. Um, to reach out more, but the little birds, you are often looking at 500 millimeters or so. I also would suggest if you can rent one, um, see what you're happy with. Um, they are out there to be rented. I know, like I say, I know uh, Service Photo in Baltimore does, but even uh, I think B&H does and so forth. So that may be another option. Um, that's a hard one. I have a two to 500. Uh, I like that one a lot um, because it gives me a nice range. It gets me out far enough. If I put a 1.4 teleconverter on it, it gets me out to about 600 and it can get me smaller things like, and the picture of the fox and the mouse was done with that one. Okay. Um, so I don't know how yeah, much that I, helps. Well, I, I usually, I'm a pet photographer and I was mm -hmm. trying to expand my, <laughs> uh huh. My well, the one to four will work great for your pets. Yeah, so I, I was debating about the one to four hundred and the four hundred and the Nikon. I know the it's a variable aperture with a one to four hundred, and mm -hmm. then the the four hundred has a, a a faster lens. Uh, is what a faster what lens. aperture is the four hundred? Uh, I think it's four four point five or something like that. Okay, four is nice. Um, it. It depends, it depends a lot on what your subjects, if the subjects are going to be smaller and foxes and things like that, then that 400 with, and if you put a teleconverter on it, a 1.4, it'll take it up to an F5.6 if it's an F4. That's not a bad aperture. Yeah, I think it's um, a 4 or 4.5, something like that. I think it's 4.5. It's the Nikon. It's the mirrorless z -mount. Okay. Okay, um, and that works really, really well. You could put a doubler on that sucker. 
Um, the doublers, if this is the Z series, the doublers and the one point foot teleconverters are wonderful. Like I say, I have a two to, I have a 70 to 200 and I put a doubler on it and it gives me basically a 400 for just hand holding and doing some uh, birds and flight type things. Um, okay, well, I, I do have, with my pet photography, I do have a 70 to 200, the Z mount. It is a Z mount? Yes. Uh, you might want to consider just getting a doubler for that for the time being. Okay. It'll give you up to 400. And then you can decide if you need more than that, then you can think about buying a 400 and expanding on that. But if you buy the doubler, that'll give you the 70 to 70 to 200, you'll be able to go up to 400 with a doubler on it. And if it's a well, series, well, it's lose, sharp. Well, I lose a lot in, um, <clears throat> in uh, aperture uh, and sharpness. Dumb question of which, mine's a 2.8. Mine's the 70 to 200 2.8 lens. Which yeah, that's what mine is. It's a 2.8. Then it's fine. Okay. I love it. Okay. It, it's a good combination. And then, yeah. Thank you. Say so it'll, if it's a 2.8 now and you put a doubler on it, it goes from 2.8 basically to 4 to 5.6. So it's a 400 5.6 lens, which is not bad. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, other questions, I'm here to answer your questions to be available to you all. Those that are left, those that aren't can check out the, uh, the video, hopefully, or the, the recording. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Seems yeah. to be a quiet night. Uh Oh, I heard somebody. I heard a man. Ken? Yeah. Um, yes. I noticed you, you advertise your uh, photo shoot or you know, things workshops. like take, take workshops mm -hmm. and uh, how does that, that work? Do you, I mean, the cost that, in, that includes you, you like, it's let's it, say you take, I have to go get reservations or whatever. All right. It depends. It depends which workshop it is. Uh, on Tianjur Island, it includes accommodations because there aren't very many accommodations. On Chincoteague, uh, I have a special rate at one of the hotels, but you make your own reservations. Most of my workshops are the ones like Tangier, Chincoteague, Assateague, they're weekend workshops, Friday night uh, through uh, two o'clock on Sunday. Um, things like South Dakota would be longer. Outer Banks is a little bit longer. Uh, Outer Banks had included room. It all depends on which workshop. I scout locations ahead of time. So usually I'm out there at least five days ahead of time. And I don't shoot when I have the group. In other words, I might shoot with my cell phone to show pictures of what might you might do, but I don't take photographs during the workshop. Uh, well, which you is know, different like, than some folks. I don't know. I, I have a camera. Uh, I, I take some of those places, and I just I, wonder I, how that that sorry, works. <laughs> Did I answer your question, Ken? And then I'll catch the next one. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, okay. Who else? Somebody else was talking? Yeah. Lady? So, sorry, Ken. This is Howie. I just uh, <clears throat> want to ask, I mean, did you have any reference in the camera that you use? I Probably mean, do you know, have any recommendation in terms of uh, camera could be the best? What or... camera to be the best for? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a hard hard question to answer i'd start looking at the uh, mirrorless cameras for sure because that's where everything's going uh and it all depends on what you can handle in terms of size etc some people will go with the olympus uh it's four thirds i know um marianne mcdonald uses it and it's a small it's a small system with a lot of power um it has a 300 millimeter lens that i think uh has a doubler and it goes to six so it's in fact, it has a small, take that back. I think it has a small sensor. So as soon as you put the 300 on, it acts like a 600 millimeter. That's a small system. It all depends on what you can carry and what you can afford. Thank you. I don't know how much. Canon, Nikon, Sony are the leaders and Olympus ain't bad either, are leaders on the mirrorless now. Sony's is very popular, one of the early ones, but Canon and Nikon are right up there. Yes, somebody else. Ken, was it? Or Ken's lit up. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm, 
I didn't speak again. You you dressed oh. me. The, the, okay. Uh, Any uh, other questions then? I see a lot of thank yous in the chat, I read. Well, I appreciate that. Any comments or anything you can, if you like the presentation and you want me back for a different topic, that's fine. Um, also, if you've got friends in other camera clubs, tell them that I do do programs and I'll be happy to talk to their club. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy meeting the people uh, and getting the questions. That's great. So, okay. Well, thank right, you so much for the invitation. Yes, thank you, you all very have much. A, have a great evening and uh, maybe I'll see you in the field somewhere or in a workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks.